Thank you very much, Pippa. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming along to listen to me. Um, as Pippa said, my role at New Lanark is Head of Heritage and Development, which is a very broad ranging role encompassing the public experience of New Lanark World Heritage Site and how we develop in a manner which benefits the site and also its users. That's the public and our residents and our, our staff. I'm very passionate about telling the stories of the site, whether that's the story of the landscape or the buildings or the industry or the people. And very often one story can't be told in a bubble. They're all interlinked. And that's what I'm hoping to do tonight is to talk about the landscape and how it has shaped New Lanark the people and the ethos of New Lanark Trust and how we, we move forward. So for those of you who don't know, New Lanark World Heritage Site is internationally recognised as a utopian mill village and the home of the social reforms of Robert Owen. But less well known is the story of the landscape in and around the village and its relationship to the people. And it's something which New Lanark Trust are trying to overcome. We are actively in our interpretation, trying to weave the story of the landscape into the story of New Lanark and tell people how integral it is to an understanding of the site. The area of which we're going to explore is a very steep glacial gorge. The fill area is almost entirely underlain by sedimentary rocks, particularly sandstone. And in the immediate vicinity of New Lanark, there is a sequence of harder bands in the rock succession. And this is partially responsible for the series of waterfalls which are now known collectively as the Falls of Clyde and include Stonebyers Lynn, Dundaff Lynn, Cora Lynn and Bonington Lynn. So the gorge has been a, a product of successive periods of glaciation and periods of erosion by the, the river. And as well as being of interest from a geological point of view, the gorge has largely escaped the effects of intensive grazing and woodland management. So it supports examples of native flora and fauna, and um, this is recognised with the status of a national nature reserve um, on New Lanark's doorstep. But the Falls of Clyde themselves drop over 40 metres in the space of just a few miles, making them some of the largest waterfalls in Scotland. And they're extremely picturesque. This picturesque beauty attracted a number of Scottish Enlightenment artists, writers and poets to the area. And if you'll forgive me for uh, reading one of the poems, I think it beautifully describes the, the context of New Lanark and the Falls of Clyde. It's by a poet called James Thompson and is the work is called The Seasons from 1729. And he says, smooth to the shelving brink, a copious flood rolls fair and placid, where collected all in one impetuous torrent down the steep, it thundering shoots and shakes the country round. At first, an azure sheet, it rushes broad, then whitening by degrees as prone it falls. And from the loud resounding rocks below, dashed in a cloud of foam, it sends aloft a hoary mist and forms a ceaseless shower. Nor can the tortured wave here find repose, but raging still amid the shaggy rocks, now flashes o'er the scattered fragments. Now aslant the hollow channel, rapid darts, 
and falling fast from gradual slope to slope with wild infracted course and lessened roar, it gains a safer bed and steals at last along the mazes a quiet veil. So with that in your head, hopefully you can hear the words as you picture the falls, first stone buyers, then Dundath, the smallest of the three, Coraline on a beautiful autumnal day, and finally Bonington Lynn, which is split. This was a very dry day just a, a few weeks ago. So a really spectacular landscape and it's a landscape which, as I said, was um, painted and written about quite regularly during the, the Enlightenment by artists like Jacob Moore, Alexander Naismith, and um, latterly it was photographed by David Octavius Hill, who you can see in this image, along with the geologist Hugh Miller. Artists, writers, geologists, great thinkers, all visiting the, the Falls of Clyde and the area during the Enlightenment, thinking about the connection and the, the interlinks in their um, professions. I'm going to take a brief minute to look at some of the, the paintings that um, came out of this period as they really help to give us an understanding of how the landscape looked and began to develop before and during the, the period that New Lanark came into being. First of all, a few views um, which are among the earliest professional paintings of the falls carried out by Paul Sandby, who was working as a team surveying Scotland with Major General William Roy. His paintings were being produced as a formal record, so there's a great deal of accuracy in, in what we see in terms of scale and the depiction of buildings. Um, the, the top one, including um, what we think may have been a grain drying kiln for Bonington Mill, and the second one, Cora Castle, in a slightly less ruinous state than uh, you will see it in some of the, the later images. The falls were also painted, as I said, by Jacob Moore, who is known as the father of the Scottish landscape and you can see three of his views here. They are celebrated as among Jacob Moore's most individual works as he painted them before he travelled to Rome on his uh, grand tour. And they have been called the earliest really ambitious celebration of the national landscape. And that's how important the, the Falls of Clyde and the, the landscape around New Lanark were viewed. Alexander Naismith, I put in primarily because he's my favourite artist. Um, and really, I feel in these views encapsulates the picturesque beauty of the, the landscape, the, the raw power and the, the beauty of the waterfalls combined with really detailed depictions of the landscape. And these two views are on the whole um, still recognisable today. And then finally, probably the most well-known paintings of New Lanark by J.M.W. Turner, who of course was known as the painter of light. And they show very romanticised views of the Falls of Clyde, but nonetheless um, really encapsulate the, the light and the fine mist and the, the scale and beauty of the falls. The fact that the falls of Clyde were the main attraction for tourists during the Enlightenment period means that contemporary records of the other important features in the area, namely the four designed landscapes of national significance are scarcer. However, the significance of these landscapes and the houses that they contain to the story of the area should not be diminished. The landscapes comprise Castlebank, 
and Braxfield to the northwest of New Lanark, Bonington to the southeast, and Corehouse to the southwest. And you can see on this map the purple area, the whole area is considered the, the Falls of Clyde designed landscape. Castle Bank, which is the furthest from New Lanark, dates back to the 18th century and is currently one of the best surviving designed landscapes, having been brought back into use as a public park by Lanark Community Development Trust. It includes magnificent walled gardens, specimen trees, and the house, as you can see, is relatively intact, albeit as flats instead of an individual house. Braxfield Estate is probably the most important designed landscape to the story of New Lanark. Robert McQueen of Braxfield, who was known as the Hanging Judge, if that tells you all you need to know about him, uh, feud the land for New Lanark to David Dale. So the site of New Lanark was originally part of, of Braxfield Estate. And it was later on to Braxfield House, which you can see here, that Robert Owen moved when his family grew too large for the manager's housing in the, the New Lanark village. Unfortunately, Braxfield House is now in an entirely ruinous state. The, the farm does exist, and I'll, I'll touch on that later and how that uh, links back again to, to New Lanark and our development plans for the future. Bonington Estate probably contained the, the most spectacular designed landscape and spectacular mansion house, but almost nothing remains now. Uh, you can see the footprints of the house in the landscape and there is a Bonington Mains farm, but out with that, it's probably the, the best opportunity to see the and experience the fluvial glacial landscape that surrounds New Lanark. And it also contains some of the remaining follies from the estate, which can be seen as part of the Falls of Clyde walkway. And again, I'll touch on them more as we move along. The final designed landscape is that of Core House, which is still a working estate to this day. And the house and estate have changed very little, but that's not to say that does not have issues, namely the use of coniferous plantations. It's on the opposite side of the river from New Lanark and the other estates, and the coniferous plantations block views to and from uh, the World Heritage Site. Just a quick look at some of the follies and features of the designed landscape surrounding New Lanark. Uh, the first is Cora Castle, or the, the ruins of Cora, Cora Castle. The second is a really unique little feature in the landscape. It's called Boddington Pavilion, part of the Boddington Estate, and was known as the Hall of Mirrors, as it was designed and built so that ladies visiting the Falls of Clyde could go in and look at the falls reflected in the mirrors as it was felt that if they viewed the falls directly, they might swoon due to the sheer raw power of the, the waterfalls. So it's a lovely little feature which we would very much like to bring back into use for everybody to, to see. Um, there's an iron bridge which spans um, the uh, Coralin Falls. Again, very little of it left. This is a, a lovely little well called Lady Mary's Well, which is still in use on the estate, and um, a grotto in Castlebank Park, which you'll be pleased to know has been uh, much restored from this image and is now a lovely space for people visiting the park. So there are some really diverse designed landscapes and estates surrounding New Lanark, um, which were 
very much uh, used by the wealthy and tourists visiting the Falls of Clyde. But that was all to change quite considerably in the, the 1780s with the coming of industry to the area. New Lanark was founded at a time of great social and political flux. We've already touched on this partly with the Scottish Enlightenment, which can be seen as a positive movement with an outpouring of intellectual, scientific and artistic accomplishments designed to improve individual lives and society as a whole. But running alongside this was the Industrial Revolution and mass mechanisation of previously cottage industries and the highland clearances, seeing thousands of tenant farmers evicted from their properties. And these three movements really combined and New Lanark was a, a product of, of that result and somewhat of a, a positive product. It was founded in 1785 by David Dale and Richard Arkwright. David Dale was a businessman and philanthropist from Glasgow who already ran several mills in Scotland. And Richard Arkwright was the inventor of the water powered spinning frame. When they visited this site uh, just down stream from the Falls of Clyde, there were already a number of smaller water mills uh, in the area and grain mills as well, but nothing to the scale that, that Dale envisaged. And he, he visited the area because he saw the potential of the landscape and the potential of the water to drive large scale production of, of cotton. He knew there was a growing demand for the fabric and he wanted to make the, the most of that. Although the site was a considerable distance from the ports of Glasgow and it was quite a marshy site, Dale and Arkwright felt that these negative issues could be overcome by the power of the River Clyde and also by the abundance of local sandstone with which they could build. So they decided to go into partnership and as the historic royal borough at the top of the hill was called Lanark, Dale and Arkwright decided to call their site New Lanark. Dale and his men were responsible for the construction of the mill buildings, while Arkwright was responsible for the training of men in installing and operating the water power system and machinery. And you can see here an illustration from 1799 by an artist called Robert Scott, which shows the vast change to the landscape in just under 15 years by Dale and Arkwright. They're primarily Dale as their partnership only lasted a year and then Arkwright moved on. But Dale ordered the construction of four large mills each powered um, by a number of water wheels. And you can see in the, each of the mills, the space for the, the output of the water after it had flown through the, the, the mills. There were originally 10 water wheels and these were gradually replaced by water turbines, but the power system remains the same and is the same to this day. Dale also built a considerable amount of housing on the site as he knew that the population of Lanark was not large enough for him to run four mills and he would need to encourage people to, to move to New Lanark. But unlike the, the dark satanic mills of Manchester and similar cities and the poor quality housing that you would often associate with uh, industry in city centres, Dale built good quality housing using local building materials uh, with wind and water tight roofs and windows. And every family who moved to New Lanark had a room with a reasonable amount of, of space. And this for Dale as a philanthropist was his way of giving back to the people 
who would run his mills. He was seen as somewhat of a, a paternalistic manager and very well thought of. The power system itself affected the, the landscape. Upstream from New Lanark, uh, Dale and his men constructed a weir which channeled water um, out of the River Clyde into a tunnel which emerged at the top end of the village. From there, the water came in to the mill laid, which runs the entire length of the, the village. It would be channeled into the water wheels via a series of sluice gates, which controlled the flow, initially manually and then laterally um, electrically. The water would then run through the wheels into the tail race and it would enter back into the Clyde at the opposite end of the village. So in, in 1785, you had an entirely green and sustainable way of powering Mill Village. No coal and no other power was used until well into the, the 19th century when a steam engine was added to provide additional power should the, the water be low. And this has had benefits for New Lanark as well as We've had to restore the site, but we've never had to clean the buildings from um, with coal dust and uh, soot. As I mentioned, Dale ran New Lanark very successfully for 15 years before selling them to his new son-in-law and the most important figure in New Lanark's history, Robert Owen. Owen was only at New Lanark for 25 years, but it's largely as a result of the reforms and the changes that he made to the site, to the landscape and to the people that New Lanark was inscribed as a World Heritage Site. He actually met David Dale because of Dale's daughter, who Owen eventually married. And he realised that New Lanark would be the perfect place to test his theories on social reform due to its relatively rural location and the fact that it was removed from the temptations of the, the city. When he arrived in New Lanark, it was a very successful mill, but Owen believed there was still much room for improvement um, in terms of both the production in the mills and the behaviour of the, the staff and the people who, who lived there. He believed that solutions to problems could be through uh, reform of the environment. So moral reform for him could only come through reform of the environment. If you gave the workforce better conditions, then they would behave better. And in his first decade, at New Lanark, he instituted a range of radical reforms, um, both physically and socially, aimed at improving the business and the moral fibre of its inhabitants, which he paid for from the profits of the mills, making it an early form of social enterprise. And he described his work as the most important experiment for the happiness of the human race that has yet been instituted in any part of the world. Um, he, he, he really did a lot of um, self-publicity in his time at, at New Lanark. So among Owen's reforms were the provision of what he called a rational system of education for every man, woman and child who lived in New Lanark. He constructed two new buildings on the site, the Institute for the Formation of Character, which does as it says on the tin, and the School for Children, where he offered structured full-time education from a very young age, making New Lanark the home to what we believe to be the world's first nursery, uh, an infant school and a junior school, where uh, children were taught a very diverse curriculum, and there was a huge focus on getting out and exploring nature and enjoying the environment around New Lanark. And this wasn't only for children. He shortened the length of the working day to allow his workers again 
to attend evening classes or to go out and explore the area and to better themselves and to better the, their lot in life and the lot of their, their family. Owen bought Braxfield Farm, the part of Braxfield Estate, and he sold produce grown on the farm in the village shop in New Lanark. He established uh, what is in essence a truck system where villagers could choose to be paid in tickets or tokens in lieu of wages and these were worth more in the village store thus encouraging villagers to shop locally and making more profit for the mills which was then invested back into to more social reforms and the village store at New Lanark is seen as um, an early exemplar of cooperation and really as the basis for the cooperative movement. In addition to buying Braxfield Farm, Owen laid out a series of paths and walkways in and around New Lanark, planting trees and setting aside land for allotments and encouraging his workers to explore the, the wider area. He saw the, the landscape as a way of counteracting any potential ill health effects from working in the mills and he knew that if his workers were healthy they would be off less sick and they would perform better and um, so his views were really very far in advance of their time because this is what you know we we consider nowadays is um, the importance of health and well-being and the environment, how, how that affects our health and well-being, and Owen saw that um, well before any of his, his contemporaries. He provided free health care for his villagers and also a, a village doctor, but the records that we have show that they saw far fewer deaths and serious illnesses in New Lanark than they might have in similar mills in the city centres. So Owen's work in uh, keeping New Lanark active and healthy really started to, to pay off. He commissioned a series of images by an artist called John Winning, which were publicity images for the site. And in them, you can see the importance that he places on the landscape. The images aren't purely of the mills or the cotton, they're of the, the situation of the mills and the fact that there are children playing and people walking and enjoying the landscape. So Owen understood this importance in marketing New Lanark and the New Lanark mills and the cotton produced there as an attractive site, a healthy site with somewhere where workers would want to be. And he often brought visitors to, to see his work and they stayed with him at his house in, in Braxfield when he, he moved there with his larger family. So the work of Owen, whilst there were later owners at New Lanark who did far more in terms of the mills, the work of Owen established New Lanark um, as a place of social reform and as a, a utopian village um, which other places um, strived to emulate. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about how New Lanark Trust has attempted to follow in the ethos of own in developing, preserving and promoting our landscape. New Lanark cannot ever be viewed in a bubble, just the village itself. It's so inherently linked to the landscapes that surround it. They're all within our buffer zone and also the town of New Lanark. And to understand one, you have to understand the history of the others. And in the last year, New Lanark Trust has entered into part, a partnership called A Vision for Lanark with several local partners, including Scottish Wildlife Trust, Lanark Community Development Trust, and the Discover Lanark Business Improvement District to create our strapline Greener Prosperity from Lanark's Sustainable Heritage, which is in effect to connect 
the, the three areas, New Lanark Village, the designed landscape of the Falls of Clyde and Lanark, effectively tell our story, produce greener energy and link the walkways and the active travel within the area to allow people to understand the full story of the area and not just little snippets of, of the site because the area is so rich in history that we want visitors to be able to, to connect that history together. The Vision Partnership is part of a wider series of partners who the Trust actively engage with. Our World Heritage Site partners include Historic Environment Scotland and South Lanarkshire Council. We have international partners and um, museum partners. We are active members of World Heritage UK and we work extensively with volunteers, our local community and also academics and uh, students in researching and understanding the, the stories that New Lanark has to tell. Um, New Lanark Trust are not the experts on, on all of the stories, so we understand the benefit of um, bringing in fresh views and fresh perspectives to our, our stories. It's important, particularly at, in recent years, for us to understand the connectivity of the landscape and the village as there have been a number of, of planning issues and development issues which have affected the site and um, could potentially have affected our, our world heritage status. And we have to be in a position to say, this is why we are responding in this way to a, a planning application or to a development decision. Could it benefit the site or is it going to negatively impact the site? The largest and the longest running was a 10 year battle, um, almost the entire length of time I've been at New Lanark with the um, multinational company Cenex, who run a quarry, which you can see um, just to the southeast of New Lanark. It sits um, just on the outskirts of the Bonington estate. Um, the Falls of Clyde finish here and they were looking to expand westward towards the, the Falls of Clyde and further into the buffer zone in New Lanark. This would have not only affected the experience of the glacial landscape, it would have affected the story of the Bonington estate and encroached on the, the falls and the wildlife reserve in a way which the trust felt was entirely unacceptable. And finally, after a long running battle, um, actively supported by the local community, the, the quarry owners decided to expand um, southeast rather than southwest. And um, that part of the landscape was saved because despite the fact that um, developers can put back um, you know, a, a spectacular landscape, it's the removal of the original landscape which affects the, the story of the site and that's where the concern comes into play for New Lanark. We've also had issues with housing development um, to the northwest. There has been um, a new housing estate which has gradually crept closer to New Lanark. It's fairly well screened from the site and has been one of the, the smaller issues that we've had to face. But recently, Braxfield Estate and Braxfield Farm, which includes the ruins of the house, has been bought by a developer. And we're entering into discussions with them on their plans for the site, which includes the potential for uh, log cabins for long term holiday stays. Now, as a site recovering from COVID-19 and the effects that that has had on income generation for so many cultural organisations, we have to take a, a pragmatic view on any future development and think, could this bring new people to the site and could it help support us long term? Yes, but 
can we allow development in the, the pure world heritage site like that? And the answer is probably no. But we're having um, fairly cordial discussions with the developers at the minute to see if they can move their plans in further into the buffer zone rather than the core world heritage site. Um, so that's a, an interesting ongoing discussion that we have. So there are some negative developments which affect the landscape, but there is also a lot of positive work which um, we are doing to conserve and promote our landscape. We have recently formed a sustainability group looking at the effect of climate change on the, the wider landscape and particularly the potential of flooding and landslip with the, the, the amount of water in the hillside above New Lanark. We're working actively with partners to, to address that and to look at the, the biodiversity of the, the designed landscapes and whether, for example, in Core House Estate, we could do as the neighbouring uh, Chapleroe and Avon Valley have done, which is remove much of the coniferous plantation and replant native species, opening up views that haven't been seen for hundreds of years and improving the biodiversity improving the quality of the land, reducing the risk of, of landslip. And um, we're hoping that this will have the benefit of setting New Lanark as a, a best practice example of um, how to address climate change and sustainability in an active and um, highly visited World Heritage Site. We are working very closely with our partners in the Vision for Lanark to improve access in and around the designed landscapes, improving the Falls of Clyde walkway and rights of way, interpretation in and around these sites, both physical and virtual, with a, we're currently working on a prototype of a mobile app which will bring some of the ruinous buildings and follies back to life as people are going around. It would just be a, a wonderful way of um, showing how the, the historic buildings looked and learning about their links to, to New Lanark. And we have also recently um, purchased two electric buses, which you can see here, uh, which will launch at the end of the month. And these are designed to take people in and around New Lanark to Castlebank Park, to Bonington Estate and into Lanark itself, um, helping link the, the designed landscapes and the, the village itself. One of the, the best and um, most enjoyable projects we've carried out in recent years linked to the landscape was on the site of Robert Owen's outdoor learning space. It's on the edge of the village, it's called Clearburn, and we ran a schools and community led project to consult on, design, develop, and construct a new natural play and picnic area, which acts as a gateway into the, the wider landscape. And the participants were involved in every stage of that. The, the construction, the design, they worked with graphic designers to develop a nature trail and the, um, the knowledge and understanding of the landscape, the benefits to the health and well-being of the people involved that came out of that were just fantastic. And it's something that we hope to continue to build on using that space and using the developments in and around the, the designed landscape. We can see the, the final area there and the building at the bottom is the, the mechanics workshop complex in, in New Lanark. So a really uh, fantastic scheme which encompasses the ethos of, of the site and the links to the landscape. We've run several landscape painting courses and talks, uh, photography sessions, all again designed to engage our local community 
with the Lanark and the wider landscape and help burst the bubble of each sitting on its, on its own. Our plans for the future are many and varied. They are set out in our World Heritage Site Management Plan for 2019 to 2023, but they primarily go back to the start in that they rest on the potential expansion of our hydro scheme, how we utilise the, the power of the River Clyde and the Falls of Clyde to expand what is at the minute uh, one historic turbine into several turbines, inline turbines, heat pumps, heat exchange, using new technologies in a way that, that fits with the ethos of the site, and then how we use this power. So can we power, for example, our local community? Can we provide power to our partners? Can we have a, a single uh, energy system run from New Lanark? Um, really building on our green credentials? Can we use it to power a new welcome hub for the area where people can come to orientate themselves before they get to New Lanark, Lanark, the Falls of Clyde, and um, enjoy the wider area? So our, our landscape is the reason for New Lanark existing. It's the, the joy for our local community it's the joy for our visitors and it's the, the way forward for us in developing a sustainable future for New Lanark, for the Falls of Clyde and for Lanark itself. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Fantastically interesting, Jane, and such a, with such a wonderful, clear overview of the area and then the uh, the development. Uh, I think Stephen's ready now to take any questions. We have a, a from the chat box. Are you ready, Stephen? I am, I am. And there's one just popped up, but I haven't actually looked at it yet. So here we are. Um, so it's from, from Diane Long. Uh, were the walks wholly new, specially designed, um, and on whose land? Uh, or, or were they developed from existing walks in the designed landscape? Um, let, do you want to take that one first? There's, there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite, a, quite a few points that are coming out with this one. So there are existing walks between New Lanark and the Falls of Clyde through land owned now by Scottish Wildlife Trust. So the part of what would have been Bonington Estate closest to the river is now the Scottish Wildlife Trust's National Nature Reserve. The other parts of the walk, we have, we promote in partnership with the landowners, so with Corehouse Estate, Castlebank is a, a public park, and um, the owners of the Braxfield Estate have always been happy for the walk to run along the edge of the Clyde without it going any further into the estate. The new owners, however, are keen because they're looking to develop the estate, are keen for the walks to branch out and for people to actually go into the, the estate. So the answer to your question is a little bit of both. There are existing walks, there are existing historic routes, which have always been used, but we are also looking to open up new walks um, up to the, the houses and the, the farms. And that's why we want to always try and maintain a very cordial relationship with our developers and not go in heavy handed and say no development um, because we, we, we see the benefit of the, the links um, between the areas and, and through the site. Uh, New Lanark itself is, is entirely open. Anyone can visit. There are no uh, charges to, to walk in and around the, around the World Heritage site. Um, no parking charges or things like that. So that was part of the question. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah. Jane, can I come, come in sideways on that one a, a little bit as well? Uh, um, um, were they, uh, how important were they for, for uh, during the 18th century, these walks? So in other words, were they part of, the, were they um, uh, planned walks from the uh, from the landscape surrounding? Were the people that, that, that moved to New Lanark allowed to walk in them? Were they encouraged to walk in them? Uh, um, uh, or was it just for poets and artists? Uh, what, what's the relationship there? So the, the Enlightenment period, the, the main walk was through Bonington Estate. So the entrance to the, 
the Falls of Clyde Grand Tour was in effect where the, the play area was, which I showed you now, Clearburn play area. There's a little bridge beside it called North Lodge Bridge. And we believe that that may have had a little sort of welcome space for people visiting almost almost like a ticket office, but not, not quite. Um, we would like to get some archeological studies done on that where people could then go up to the, up through Bonington Estate towards the falls to the, the Hall of Mirrors and the well, and there were a set of steps called Lady Mary's Steps, which took visitors right down onto the edge of the, the, the river. So that was the, the key part for, um, for the, the artists and the writers and the, the gentry per se. But in Robert Owen's time, that moved to the, the walks which he laid out in New Lanark for his workers to enjoy. So he owned the land, so they could go anywhere in that space. And obviously with the purchase of Bratsfield uh, Farm, that means his villagers could go there as well. So there was a, a, a walk for the wealthy and the tourists, and then a space for the, the mill workers. And these gradually began to merge and, and uh, link together. Okay, that's good. Uh, um, uh, let's finish uh, uh, Diane's question here, uh, and I think you may have answered some of these already. Uh, uh, were there any structures on the walk? So you, you, you've told us that yes, there there, there were. Uh, um, on the different walks, are there uh, are there different structures? Or, are are there uh, were were there? It sounds to me as if there are a number of walks that were laid out. You've got access at least uh, 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 to 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 those, uh, um, and they've been laid out at different times. I presume. I don't know if I'm if I'm right in saying that. Yes, the most of the remains of any of the features and follies are. Um, let me just jump back. Are on the Bonington Estate. There is very little remaining on the. The other estates bar the farms um, and Cora Castle, which is in Core House Estate. So it, it, it was the original castle. It predates any of the, the designed estates. Uh, so that's Core House has the original mansion house, the farm and Cora Castle. Bonington Estate has no original house, but several follies, bridges and features. Castlebank Park has the original house and the grotto. It's also probably got the, the most intact landscape because that's been brought back into use. And Braxfield, we hope potentially as part of the new development, we'll be able to um, open that up and bring back into use. I think I believe there's a a nice house, there's the ruins of the house itself. So we'll be able to actually um, open those up and interpret those with the, with the new developer. Great. Last part uh, of Diane's question here <clears throat> uh, um, uh, refers to another industrial landscape. Uh, um, I'm thinking uh, of any parallels with the walks for workers uh, in the Colebrook Dales designed uh, in the Colebrook Dales, Dales designed by uh, Richard Reynolds, which included seats, buildings uh, like a temple and a rotunda. So uh, have you, I, mean, I don't know uh, um, if you know that landscape, but... Uh, um, I, I can't say I do. No? Most of the, I can't imagine that there are not similar parallels. Um, <clears throat> most of the, the comparisons around New Lanark are on the village itself and the Robert Owen's utopian vision, you know, how that affected the development of um, Saltair, Derwent Valley Mills, ideal towns and communities. Um, so I would be lying if I said I knew um, about similar landscapes, but it's again, as I, as I said, you know, we don't, we're not the experts in everything at New Lanark. And we hope to, over the next year or so, develop a research framework for the site to, to pull out the stories and the comparisons with other landscapes like that. So it's a, a, a very valid question, which I would like to explore further. Thank you. Good. Uh, um, uh, there's one here from Pippa. Uh, um, the trees, what trees did Robert Owen plant? Uh, and does his planting still exist? 
So do you know if there were uh, there were any uh, any trees planted either by him personally or or or, or uh, under his auspices? Sure. <laughs> there are four lime trees which are still oh. in existence. I, I Pippa, funnily enough, I was desperately trying to find a picture of this earlier and couldn't. So I went onto Google Maps and tried to use that, but it sits. The, the pathways which Robert Owen um, laid out, let me see if I can show you on one of the aerial photographs. Sits, uh, here we go. So this pathway, which winds up through uh, the landscape up into Lanark, was laid out by Robert Owen, as was this one. And he planted one, two, three, four lime trees. So we know that they date from um, Robert Owen's period specifically. Most of the other planting is, is more recent, but those four lime trees have survived. Good stuff. Uh, uh, now, uh, from a, I've got, a, got my own question here, but while we're on trees, I wonder if we could, if I could, could talk about it. Uh, and that's, you've got some fabulous beaches, uh, some multi-planted, uh, multi-stemmed, uh, um, or some uh, uh, bundle planted trees uh, um, in the walks going up towards Coraline. Uh, um, and there are, there are a number, there are two beech trees I know that exist uh, um, um, by the pavilion, uh, 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 the, um, and I wondered how they. I wonder. I, I wonder really whether they are uh, uh, listed. Whether whether you have whether anybody surveyed the area to, to find out what was planted there in the eighteenth century and and what still exists from those days. Yes, we've had two studies done. We've had an ancient tree study right. uh, done for the full area, which takes in Castlebank Park. Um, I mean, you can see sort of some of the historic planting towards Castlebank um, and this is Braxfield Estate, you can see some of the planting there, um, Castlebank just out of the picture. And we've also had a woodlands management plan um, produced for us, so we are actively on this side of the gorge working to preserve the ancient trees and bring back native species with Scottish Wildlife Trust and with the, the landowners. Um, but as you will see, this, this picture is actually a perfect example um, with the difficulties I was talking about within Core House with the coniferous plantations. Because New Lanark, as a World Heritage Site, um, one of the most important aspects is the views to and from the World Heritage Site and protecting those. And most of the the landscape is authentic and the views are authentic, with the exception of the views to and from the core house side of the, the river, which are almost entirely obscured mm. by um, non-native coniferous plantations. It's, uh, it's a very difficult one working. I didn't realise, I have to say, that how, how many sites that you that, that were included in, in the in the whole whole landscape uh, mm -hmm. uh, and coming under different management. I know from uh, from practical uh, uh, experience myself the, the difficulties involved in working with neighbours. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that's a challenge you're 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 facing very well. I think um, <laughs> we're, we're we're making we're making steps. I think it's <laughs> it's always the 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 issue in trying to link um, a, a tourist site with uh, stakeholders who might not want tourists or yeah. footfall onto their, their state or might want different types of development. But as I say, we, we've got to take into account the, the full picture because we cannot um, exist in a bubble. Um, the hist our history doesn't exist in a bubble and our future can't exist in a bubble. We, we have to work collaboratively with our partners and stakeholders. Uh, let's read out the next one. Another one from uh, from Diane Long. She's been very greedy here. Uh, um, uh, did Dale model his housing on those built by Arkwright uh, uh, at Cromford and elsewhere? Do you know? I don't know if he specifically modelled it on Cromford. Um, Dale, we know, uh, believed that he could make better quality tenement housing. The, the site itself, it, it basically had to be tenement housing because it's in such a long, narrow strip. Um, but it's much more spaced out than traditional housing. Um, it's lower density. Um, there are a number of buildings. Most of them are single ends. 
um, but there are a number which are uh, double, double rooms, um, double thickness. So I couldn't see specifically. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever picked up on that. Um, what I can see is that we do know that uh, Dale's house in Glasgow was designed by Robert Adam. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, but we have some um, illustrations of it. And we believe that Dale, as well as following the, the traditional Mason Mill style for his mills, we believe he may have said, you know, I would like these mills to have, to add in, because they're, they're, they're quite unique and quite um, sort of classical in their appearance. Um, before the mills were changed, um, you can just see here, mill number one. I, I, I think everyone can see my cursor when I screen share, is that correct? Um, yes, yeah, well, at least all, I can see it. All of the mills were originally identical to mill number one, and there were four. So before the expansion, and the removal of the pitched roof of Mill 2 and the rebuild of Mill 3 following fire and the demolition of Mill 4 following fire, they were all identical. So you really had a very elegantly classical series of facades along the riverside and, and the scale, you know, um, very akin to, to looking along um, the, the new town in Edinburgh. They, they weren't mill buildings which jarred with the landscape and you, you find that in the illustrations. Yes, there were writers and poets and painters visiting the Falls of Clyde, but there are also a number of contemporary depictions of New Lanark. So we found that um, at the time, as well as um, Gail and Owen seeing the site as a, a, a place of social reform, the, the physical site itself mm -hmm was um was designed to be as attractive as possible for an industrial site both in terms of the, the housing and the industrial buildings themselves and the landscape as well yeah terrific oh, yeah. um i think um there are two uh, um, thank yous for one from diane uh, and one from uh, Catherine von Olden um, to say what, how much they've enjoyed it. Uh, um, that's the that's the end of the grilling. I don't think I've I, I've got anything else to uh, uh, to, to to say. Uh, um, Michael Ann, can I hand back to you? Let's see if she switches on. <laughs> Michael Ann. Thank you so much, Jane. Sorry um, to be mess messing about there. Um, thank you. That was just absolutely brilliant. And so uh, for somebody like myself who doesn't know very much about Nunaric, it was just a, a revelation. I'm sure for those who know more, uh, it was an in-depth understanding developed. So thank you. If we all were to um, unmute ourselves, we could give uh, Jane uh, uh, some applause <laughs> to thank her. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for asking me along. And um, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you. It certainly thank did. You very much. Thank you. And can I just remind everyone that next uh, next Thursday, uh, Catherine von Alten uh, will be speaking. Uh, on the subject of can we change the image of the Japanese knotweed? So quite a change uh, in subject matter. Uh, but we'll, uh, so we hope to see some of you then. And um, thank you very much for coming. Good night. <laughs>